Buried beneath the seaside town of Ramsgate, England, lies a hidden network of over three and a half miles of tunnels. Although people flock here to enjoy the sun, it was once a vulnerable wartime target. The safety it provided underground made an indelible mark on history. The tunnels were known to Hitler, but they couldn't be destroyed. This unlikely civilian bomb shelter became a permanent refuge after a devastating attack known as the murder raid. They turned over the town and dropped 300 bombs. What was subterranean life like for tens of thousands of people? And how did construction innovations make this life-saving network possible? It was one of the largest construction projects in the country. Situated on the east coast of Britain, the town of Ramsgate was one of the great seaside resorts of the 18th and 19th century. Princess Victoria stayed in a hotel just up on the cliff top. Although the town's well known for royal visitors, its most significant features were built beneath, starting with a subterranean railway that connected the harbor with the main train line. Helen Seton is a local expert. The railways arrived in Ramsgate in 1846. In 1863, this tunnel was opened and it came out onto a station right next to the beach. But this seaside getaway sometimes fell in the line of fire. From 1914 to 18, World War I was raging. Ramsgate's proximity to Europe was now attracting a far more unwelcome visitor. The mighty Zeppelins and those early aeroplanes would use Ramsgate as a target, and they would follow the coast around and then up the Thames to drop bombs on London. As they came over Ramsgate, they would drop bombs as well. 29 residents lost their lives in these World War I bombing raids. But more was yet to come. By 1936, as potential conflict loomed with Germany, local engineer Richard Brimmel came up with an ingenious plan to protect the town's residents from a future attack. He realized, watching the newsreel footage of the Spanish Civil War and finding out about the tunnels underneath Barcelona, that the people of Ramsgate could do better than inadequate surface shelters. Brimmel designed a network of air raid precaution tunnels beneath the town, using the railway tunnel as its hub. The council turned them down flat. Far too expensive. What do we need this for anyway? There's not going to be a war. However, in 1938, Ramsgate elected a new mayor, Arthur Bloomfield Courtney Kemp. ABC Kemp, as he was known, supported Brimmel's proposal and enlisted World War I Air Force Captain H.H. Balfour to assist in the construction of the tunnel system. The need for tunnels after the experience of the First World War was made even more imperative by the fact that there was an RAF fighter base two miles outside the town, and Ramsgate was in the direct flight path. In 1939, after several rejections by the British government due to cost and foreign policy conflicts, Kemp and Balfour finally received approval to break ground on their two-and-a-half-mile-long network. And by March 1939, just months before Britain entered World War II, excavation began on what would become the largest air raid shelter in Britain. 80 mainly Kent miners were employed. They worked in two shifts of 40, 12 hours a shift, and the work carried on seven days a week. By August 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and Britain declared war on Germany. Bombing raids were now inevitable, and these tunnels needed to be finished quickly. They started work at a rate of 24 feet a day, which is roughly where I'm standing, back to you. In an amazing feat of human strength, skill, and backbreaking labor, 
the 80 miners managed to dig out two and a half miles of tunnels by hand in just nine months. How the tunnel system protected the 30,000 residents from the German Air Force was remarkable. 12 permanently open entrances meant that no one in the center of town was further than five minutes from safety when the sirens started. It was essential that people could get underground rapidly because it only took the German fighters five minutes to get across the channel. But how they constructed the tunnels needed to take into consideration the soft chalk they were digging in. As tunnel manager Isaac Naylor explains. As easy as chalk is to dig through, they still had to employ pneumatic shovels to be able to cut away at the front. And then that was then broken up and shoveled by hand into the, some small mine carts. The tunnels were seven feet wide by six foot high, any larger than this, and they would have been made unstable. Despite their stability, the tunnels still required some reinforcement. So engineers utilized a unique building material for the time. We've actually been walking uphill on a gradient of one in 600. We've now got the concrete reinforcing, some 12 inches of reinforced concrete primarily because as we go above 30 feet, chalk becomes weaker and weaker. Construction shafts were built to provide access for the miners. This is a construction shaft, one of 11, that was bored down from the surface to allow the miners to ex excavate the spoil that they had created while digging. Their diesel locomotives pulled the trucks to um, points like this. The trucks were turned 90 degrees before being pushed into the center there. At the heart of Brimmel's design was the use of Ramsgate's existing Victorian railway tunnel and infrastructure. We've got the ventilation shaft above our heads to make sure that all of the smoke and debris that was being created as the trains ran through, it had a chance to escape out up into the atmosphere. When the sirens sounded, warning of an imminent attack, people had only minutes to get below ground. We're now standing at one of the original entrances. This would have all originally been open to the elements. The entrances were designed to have a funneling effect to fit as many people in as possible at the initial entry point. By the time they got down towards the tunnels themselves, there would be no more than two people standing abreast so they could filter off into the smaller tunnels. The shelter's capacity was intentionally designed to accommodate double the population of Ramsgate. There's enough room within these tunnels to house 60,000 people. That was 30,000 permanent residents and an additional 30,000 holidaymakers who our mayor, ABC Kemp, felt that even during the Second World War, people would still want to come on their summer holidays. The town were then marketed as the safest resort in the country. Richard Brimmel's custom-built tunnels were like none seen before in Britain, engineered to protect the lives of every man, woman, and child in Ramsgate, as the Luftwaffe bombarded them from above. Each of the entrances, we had two right-angle bends to counteract bomb blast and shrapnel. Should a bomb land on or near the entrance, it, it wouldn't be able to penetrate any further into the tunnel network. These right angles were to prove incredibly effective on one particular night known as the Murder Raid. On August 24th, 1940, at the height of the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe sent a bomber squadron to the nearby Royal Air Force Base. Ultimately, the RAF prevailed, but Ramsgate was attacked in what's known as the world's worst assault from the air. They turned over the town and in the next five minutes, dropped 300 bombs. Britain's largest underground shelter, the Ramsgate Tunnels, valiantly protected its residents from this deadly assault. During that raid, 300 bombs killed 27 civilians and three service personnel. The rest of the town, thousands and thousands of them, were safe down here, even with 300 bombs going off. Deep in the tunnels right here, you would not have heard anything. It was this day that was known as the murder raid. The bombs destroyed 78 houses, 
left 300 unfit for habitation and a further 700 damaged. The murder raid left thousands of Ramsgate residents homeless, and the tunnels suddenly took on a new purpose. This is the beginning of our tunnel town. Jill Gilmore is an expert on Ramsgate's turbulent history and its underground tunnels known to the locals as Tunnel Town. When people finally had the all clear after the murder raid, they left the tunnels and they went up out into the open and it must have been like going into a scene from Dante's Inferno. There was smoke, there were flames, there were buildings that had collapsed, buildings that were on fire. You were confused because landmarks had gone and the road was blocked. And then imagine the horror of getting to your house, only it wasn't there. The chalk tunnels were not designed for long-term habitation. And while some people moved back above ground, some chose to continue living in Tunnel Town. You would think, why on earth would anybody want to live here? It's appalling conditions. But they had to make the choice of, do I live in a house that may be already damaged, that could be damaged again and worry every night? Or do I come down here where I am 100% safe? So the people just said, we're staying here. People gathered what they could from the remnants. They gathered old clothes, horses, old curtains, blankets to make a screen. And the council even found the deck chairs that they'd put in storage for the duration of the war. But over that first weekend, this is how they stayed. Gradually, the place evolved into a subterranean neighborhood with a strong sense of community. In the evening, there would be all the families around playing games, the kids running around. This is where the main part of Tunnel Town was constructed. And this was a cafe that they could come and get food. And also the cafe owner was obliged to let them have hot water at night if you have a baby and you needed to heat up a bottle. Even the children growing up in Tunnel Town maintained a relatively normal life. The schools that were left had very few teachers, so the pupils just went in for an hour a day, and then they were free to roam around. Every entrance to the tunnels leads onto a public open space. The mums could just say, oh, go out and play football, knowing that they didn't have to go any further than the top of the staircase to be in an open space. After the war, many families remained in the tunnels while the town was being rebuilt above them, until the last Tunnel Town residents left in the late 1940s. Thanks to Richard Brimmel's engineering genius and the persistence of ABC Kemp and H.H. Balfour, today the tunnels are a lasting testament to how great feats of engineering can change the course of history. The tunnels were known to Hitler, but they were so well constructed and so deep in most places that they couldn't be destroyed. 